voiceover version was dubbed factual. It added a simple, step-by-step -step account of the action as it happened. A second version was called emotional. It was largely the same as the factual, but included a critical turning point, words expression, expressing the emotional tenor of the scene underway. Sets of nine-year-old children were tested for recall and asked to rate the version they saw on a scale of pleasantness. The factual version was consistently rated the least pleasant and was also the worst remembered. The most pleasant was the original wordless version, which was rated just slightly above the emotional, and it was the emotional version that was the best remembered. This is a bit muddling. Something stranger happened when the subjects of the study were asked to rate the individual scenes in the film simultaneously on a happy-sad scale and a pleasant-unpleasant scale. The sad scenes were rated the most pleasant and the sadder the better. The hypothesis that immediately suggests itself is that some kind, in some kind of precocious anti freudian protest, the children were equating arousal with pleasure. But this being an empirical study, they were wired. The physiological reactions were monitored. The factual version elicited the highest level of arousal, even though it was the most unpleasant, i.e. happy. It made the least long-lasting impression. The children, it turns out, were physiologically split. Factuality made their heart beat faster and deepened their breathing, but it made their skin resistance fall. The original non-verbal version elicited the greatest response in their skin. Galvanic skin response measures autonomic reaction. From the tone of their report, it seems that the researchers were a bit taken aback by their results. They contented themselves with observing that the difference between sadness and happiness is not all that it's cracked up to be, and worried that the difference between children and adults was also not all that it's cracked up to be, judging by the studies of adult retention of news broadcasts. The only positive conclusion was the primacy of the affective in image reception. Accepting and expanding upon that, it can be noticed the primacy of the affective is marked by a gap between the content and the effect. It would appear that the strength or duration of an image's effect is not logically connected to the content in any straightforward way. This is not to say that there is no connection and no logic. What is meant here by the content of the image is its indexing to conventional meaning in an intersubjective context, its sociolinguistic qualification. This indexing fixes the quality of the image. The strength or duration of the image's effect could be called its intensity. What comes out here is that there is no correspondence or conformity between quality and intensity. There is a relation that is of another nature. To translate this negative observation to a positive one, the event of image perception is multi-level, or at least bi-level. There is an immediate bifurcation and response into two systems. One, the level of intensity, is characterized by a crossing of semantic wires. On it, sadness is pleasant. The level of intensity is organized according to a logic that does not admit of the excluded middle. This is to say that it is not semantically or semiotically ordered. It does not fix distinctions. Instead, it vaguely but insistently connects what is normally indexed as separate. When asked to, to signify itself, it can only do so in paradox. There is a disconnection of signifying order from intensity, which constitutes a different order of connection operating in parallel. The gap noted earlier is not only between content and effect, it is also between the form of content, signification of the conventional system of distinctive difference, and intensity. The disconnection between form content and its intensity effect is not just negative, it enables a different connectivity, a different difference in parallel. Both levels, qualification and intensity, are immediately embodied. Intensity is embodied in purely autonomic reactions most directly manifested in the skin at the surface of the body at its interface with things. Depth reactions belong more to form content or qualification level, even though they also involve autonomic functions such as heartbeat and breathing. The reason may be that they are associated with expectation, which depends on consciously positioning oneself in a line of narrative continuity. Modulations of heartbeat and breathing mark a, re mark a reflex of consciousness into the autonomic depths, coterminous with the rise of the autonomic into consciousness. They are conscious autonomic mix, a mix, a measure of their participation in one another. Intensity is beside that loop, a non-conscious, never to be conscious, autonomic remainder. It is outside expectation and adaptation, as disconnected from meaningful, meaningful sequencing, from narration, as it is from vital function. It is narratively delocalized, 
spreading over the generalized body surface like a lateral backwash from the function meaning interludes, traveling the vertical path between head and heart. Language, though headstrong, is not simply in opposition to intensity, but it seemed to function differentially in relation to it. The factual version of the snowman story was deafening. Matter of factness dampens intensity. In this case, matter of factness was a doubling of the sequence of images with the narration, expressing in as objective manner a manner as possible, a common sense function, and consensual meaning of the movements perceived on the screen. This interfered with the image's effect. The emotional version added a few phrases that punctuated the narrative line with qualifications of the emotional content as opposed to the objective narrative content. The qualifications of emotional content enhanced the image's effect as if they resonated with the level of intensity rather than interfering with it. An emotional qualification breaks narrative continuity for a moment to register a state, actually re-register an already felt state, for the skin is faster than the word. The relationship between the levels of intensity and qualification is not one of conformity or correspondence, but of resonation or interference, amplification or dampening. Linguistic expression can resonate with and amplify intensity at the price of making itself functionally redundant. But on the other hand, it doubles the sequence of movements in order to add something to it in the way of meaningful progression. In this case, a sense of futurity, expectation, and intimation of what comes next in the of progression, then it runs counter to and dampens the intensity. Intensity would seem to be associated with nonlinear processes, resonation, and feedback, which momentarily stop, suspend the linear progress of the narrative present from past to future. Intensity is qualifiable as an emotional state, and that state is static, temporal, and narrative noise. It is a state of suspense, potentially of disruption. It's like a temporal sink, a whole of time as you conceive of it and narrativize it. It's not exactly passivity because it's filled with motion, vibratory motion, resonation. And it's not yet activity, because the motion is not of the kind that can be directed, if only symbolically, toward practical ends in a world of constituted objects and aims, if only on screen. Of course, the qualification of an emotion is quite often, in other contexts, itself a narrative element that moves the action ahead, taking its place in socially recognized lines of action and reaction. But the extent that it is, it is not in resonance with intensity. It resonates to the exact degree to which it is in excess of any narrative or functional line. In any case, language doubles the flow of images on another level, on a different track. There is a redundancy of resonation that plays up or amplifies the fact this connection enabling a different connectivity. And a redundancy of signification that plays out or linearizes, jumps the feedback loop between vital function and meaning into lines of socially valorized action and reaction. Language belongs to entirely different orders depending on which redundancy it enacts. Or it always enacts both, more or less completely. Two languages, two dimensions of every expression. One superlinear, the other linear. Every event takes place on both le levels, and between both levels they resonate together to form a larger system composed of two interacting subsystems following entirely different rules of formation. For clarity, it might be best to give different names to the two halves of the event. In this case, suspense could be distinguished from an interlinked expectation as superlinear and linear dimensions of the same image event, which is at the same time an expression event. Approaches to the image and its relation to language are incomplete if they operate only on a semantic or semiotic level. However, that level is defined linguistically, logically, narratologically, ideologically, or all these in combination as a symbolic. What they lose precisely is the expression event in favor of structure. Much could be gained by integrating the dimension of intensity into cultural theory. The stakes are the new. The structure is the place where nothing ever happens, that explanatory heaven in which all eventual permutations are prefigured in a self-consistent set of structured, of invariant generative rules. Nothing is prefigured in the event. It is a collapse of structure's distinction into intensity of rules and paradox. It is a suspension of that of invariant that makes happy happy, sad sad, function function, and meaning mean. Could it be that it is through the expected suspension of that suspense that the new emerges? As if an echo of irreducible excess of intuitive amplification piggyback on the reconnection to progression, bringing a tinge of the unexpected, the lateral, the unmotivated lines of action and reaction, a change in the role. The expression event is a system of inexplicable emergence into and against uh, regeneration, the reproduction of the structure. 
In the case of the snowman, the unexpected and inexplicable that emerged along with the generated responses had to do with the differences between happiness and sadness, children and adults, not being all they cracked up to be, much to our scientific chagrin, a change in the rules. Intensity is the unassimilable. For present purposes, intensity will be equated with affect. Frederick Jameson, notwithstanding, belief is waned for many, but not affect. If anything, our condition is characterized by a surfeit of it. The problem is that there is no cultural theoretical vocabulary specific to affect. Our entire vocabulary has derived from theories of signification that are still wedded to structure, even across the earth inviolable differences, the divorce proceedings of post-structuralism, terminable or interminable. In the absence of an a-signifying philosophy of affect, it is also easy for received psychological categories to slip back in, undoing the considerable deconstructive work that has been effectively carried out by post-structuralism. Affect is most often used loosely as a synonym for emotion. But one of the clearest lessons of this first story is that emotion and affect, if affect is intensity, follow different logics and change different orders. An emotion is a subjective content, a sociolinguistic fixing of the quality of an experience, which is from that point onward defines personal. Emotion is qualified intensity, the conventional, consensual, pointed insertion of intensity into semantically and semiotically formed progressions, into narrativizable action reaction circuits, into function and meaning. It is intensity owned and recognized. It is crucial to theorize the difference between affect and emotion. If some have the impression that affect is waned, it is because affect is unqualified. As such, it is not ownable or recognizable. It is thus resistant to critique. It is not that there are no philosophical antecedents to draw on. It is just that they haven't been the usual ones of the cultural theory. Spinoza is a formidable precursor on many of these points on the difference in nature between affect and emotion, on the irreducibly bodily and autonomic nature of affect, on affect as a suspension of action reaction circuits and linear temporality in a sink of what might be called passion to distinguish it both from passivity and activity, on the equation between affect and effect, on the form content of conventional discourse as continuing on a separate stratum running counter to the full registering of affect and its affirmation, its positive development, expression as and for itself. The title of Spinoza's central work suggests a designation for the project of thinking affect, ethic. This is another story, and this time it's about the brain. It's the mystery of the, of the missing half second. Experiments were performed on patients who had been implanted with cortical electrodes for medical purposes. Mild electrical pulses were administered to the electrode and all such points on the skin. In either case, the stimulation was felt only if it lasted for more than half a second. Half a second, the minimum perceivable lapse. If the cortical electrode was fired a half second before the skin was simulated, patients reported feeling the skin pulse first. The researcher speculated that sensation involves what he called a backward referral in time. In other words, that sensation is organized recursively before being linearized, before it is redirected outward to take its part in the conscious chain of actions and reactions. Brain and skin form a resonating vessel. Stimulation turns inward, it's folded into the body, except that there is no inside for it to be in, because the body is radically open, absorbing impulses quicker than they can be perceived, and because the entire vibratory event is unconscious, out of mind. Its anomaly is smoothed over retrospectively to fit conscious requirements of continuity and linear causality. So it happens during the missing half second. A second experiment gave some hints. Brain waves of healthy volunteers were monitored by a EEG machine. The subjects were asked to flex a finger at a moment of their choosing and to note the time of their decision on the clock. The flexes came 0.2 seconds after they clocked the decision, but the EEG machine registered significant brain activity 0.3 seconds before the decision. Again, a half second lapse between the beginning of a bodily event and its completion and an outwardly directed active expression. Asked to speculate on what implications all this might have for a doctrine of free will, the researcher, Benjamin Leibitt, proposes that we may exert free will not by initiating intention, but by vetoing, exceeding, or otherwise responding to them after they arise. In other words, the half second is missed not because it is empty, but because it is over full, in excess of the actually performed action and of its described meaning. Will and consciousness are subtractive, 
there are limitative derived functions which reduce a complexity too rich to be functionally expressed. It should be noted in particular that during the mysterious half second, what we think of as free higher functions such as volition are apparently being performed by autonomic bodily reactions occurring in the brain but outside consciousness and between brain and finger but prior to action and expression. The formation of a volition is necessarily accomplished and aided by cognitive functions. Perhaps the snowman reset of the first story couldn't find cognition because they were looking for it in the wrong place, in the mind rather than in the body they were monitoring. Talk of intensity inevitably raises the objection that such a notion involves an appeal to a pre-reflexive, romantically raw domain of primitive experiential richness, the nature and our culture. It is not that, first because something happening out of mind in a body directly absorbing its outside cannot exactly set to be experienced. Second, because volition, cognition, and presumably other higher functions usually presumed to be in the mind, figured as a mysterious container of mental entities that is somehow separate from the body and brain, are present and active in that now not so raw domain. Resonation assumes feedback. Higher functions belonging to the realm of qualified form content in which identified self-expressive persons interact in conventionalized action-reaction circuits following a linear timeline are fed back into the realm of intensity and recursive causality. The body doesn't just absorb pulses or discrete stimulation, stimulation. It infolds contexts. It infolds volitions and cognitions that are nothing if not situated. Intensity is asocial, but it is not pre-social. It includes social elements, but mixes them with elements belonging to other levels of functioning and combines them according to different logics. How could this be so? Only if the trace of past actions, including a trace of the context, were conserved in the brain and in the flesh, but out of mind and out of body, understood as qualifiable interiority, active and passive, respectively, directed spirit and dumb matter. Only if past actions and context were conserved and repeated, autonomically reactivated, but not accomplished, begun, but not completed. Intensity is incipient, incipient action and expression. Intensity is not only incipients, but the incipients of mutually exclusive path pathways of action and expression that are then reduced, inhibited, prevented from actualizing themselves completely, all but one. Since the crowd of pretenders to actualization is tending toward completion in a new context, uh, its incipients cannot just be the cultivation and reactivation. These are tendencies, in other words, Pastnesses opening onto a future with no present to speak of, for the present is lost in the missing half second, passing too quickly to be perceived, too quickly actually to happen. This requires a reworking of how we think about the body. Something that happens too quickly to have happened actually is virtual. The body is as immediately virtual as it is actual. The virtual, the pressing crowd of incipiencies and tendencies, is a realm of potential. In potential is where futurity combines unmediated pastness, <coughs> where outsides are infolded, and sadness is happy, happy because of pressed action and expression of life. The virtual is a lived paradox where what we are norm where what are normally opposites coexist, coalesce, and connect, where what can cannot be experienced cannot but be felt, albeit reduced and contained. For out of the pressing crowd, an individual action or expression will emerge and be registered consciously. One wills it to emerge, to be qualified, to take on sociolinguistic meaning, to enter linear action-reaction circuits, to become a constant in one's life, by the instant condition. Since the virtual is unlivable, even as it happens, it can be thought of as a form of superlinear abstraction that does not obey the law of the excluded middle, that is organized differently, but is inseparable from the concrete activity and ex expressivity of the body. The body is as immediately abstract as it is concrete. Its activity and exp expressivity extend, as on their underside, into an incorporeal, yet perfectly real dimension of pressing potential. And on a lot of these points, it's the work of Bergson that does stand as an important uh, precursor on the brain as a center of indetermination. Consciousness is subtractive and inhibited. Perception is working to infold extended actions and expressions and their situatedness into a dimension of intensity or intention as opposed to extension. The continual doubling of the actual body by this dimension of intensity and the superlinear, super abstract realm of potential. That realm of the virtual is having a different temporal structure in which past and future brush shoulders with no mediating presence and is having a different recursive causality. The virtual is cresting in a liminal realm of emergence where half actualized actions and expressions arise like waves on a sea which they must, to which they no sooner return. 
Um, so this is the, the beginnings of something where I'd like to try to connect up Spinoza on affect and Bergson on, on movement and sensation. And moving, <clears throat> I guess, a countercurrent to, what, to a lot of what might happen at this conference toward a kind of analog theory of the circulation of images. Um, I think the, f the first move is to go back to um, a use of the virtual that doesn't just set it in the future sort of apocalyptically as a state that, that, that we are all um, sort of surging for, but finds it right here in the body, in nature as well as technology, as a dimension of the body that's real and material, but incorporeal in the sense that it's not flexible in relation to extensive or extended frameworks of linear time and three-dimensional script three-dimensional space that's both real and abstract with, with no opposition between the real, the real and the virtual. Um, so this means positing a dimension of the body, again, that's incorporeal, that has a different mode of organization from the actual body. So it means trying to plumb a kind of ontological difference uh, internal to the body. Um, and that dimension seems to be best conceptualized in Bergson and also in the philosopher of science, Simon Don, as a dimension of emergence, where half-formed thoughts or actions, perceptions, sensations, volitions sort of come into and out of existence. It's almost uh, you know, faster than can be clocked, almost like, like quantum particles proper to the level of, of, of a person. And these uh, are called by Simon Don germinal forms. And what they're forms of, it's not a contour or an, or an abstract form in that sense, but what they're forms of is bodily connectivity, the connectability of the body that is synesthetic, that, that, that connect all those levels. And it's a kind of bubbling of potential bodily connections that are all in immediate contact with one another. And what they emerge into is an already formed situation because there's no point of origin for the actual. And the situation is, the situation limits the emergence by selecting certain connections to express an action and in words. And these become fully formed. Um, but they take on a new inflection by the situation. So they become, at, uh, at the same time, a repetition of certain rules operating on the actual level and a new variation of them. So it emerges as a newness, but a limited newness. So this is a kind of uh, reversal of, of um, a lot of uses, especially in cultural theory of concepts of determination, where there's a subject, a positional structure, a subjective structure that then determine subjective effects. And um, it just reverses into a, 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 very, a highly organized, highly differentiated realm, but, but it's still in a way objectively indeterminate, and determination is a reduction of or a limitation of that. Uh, so it finds limitation uh, an actual boundary existence as an end product, which is in a way inert, kind of inert, precipitate of something that, that, that the process is quite different. And that can be connected into theories of complexity and theories of chaos. Um, so the limitation that takes place in, in actual situations consists in separating, separating out different connectabilities so that each has an actual level of expression of its own that's particular to it, its own orders of connection. For example, thought, so that's separating itself out from the ongoing flow of perception. It also involves a hierarchization, an ordered progression from one level to another. another. For example, thought, which is supposed to precede action or volition, preceding interested perception, or volition subordinated to reason. So it's, there's a separation, a hierarchization, and a reintegration into the functional whole that we think of as a self. Uh, so this is a kind of complex model where there are two ontologically different dimensions and then a many level actuality. And at every moment, there's a kind of instantaneous bifurcation from the level of emergence 
to all of the axial levels at the same time, which are reactualized with variation, they're reintegrated with one another in every situation, recreated at every moment. The kind of ontogenetic pulsing that's internal to every moment. So what a body actually is and does, and what actual form it takes, again, is at the end of a process of emergence that emerges into limitation. It's the effect of a limitative differentiation of levels. Um, <coughs> now where this could potentially connect into the sort of theory of image and image circulation is in the, the idea that actual actions and expressions are kind of in their precipitate that come at the end of this process, but, but still by virtue of having been in a situation and being re-injectable into another situation and having the ability to cross from one situation to the next, retain a kind of fringe of virtuality, a, a kind of trace or memory of a different order of organization, which is the virtual. Um, and I'd like to sort of try to maybe go back to certain theories that I think you'd find in some authors like um, uh, some of Benjamin's work and in some of the early Bakhtin, where expressions are seen as conveyances. They're not seen, first of all, as signification, but as conveyances that have a kind of charge of reality or existential charge that they carry that can be reactualized and re-unfolded. Um, so, I guess in the in the long run, uh, the project is to, to rethink circulation of images and information as potentially potentializing, um, but emphasizing that what potential actually unfolds upon reception has to do with other apparatuses than the apparatuses that produce them or the formal characteristics of the images or expressions. That there are apparatuses of of actualization, of reception that have to do not just with technology in the in the narrow sense, but social technologies of, of attention, of um, the implantation into social contexts of technology that determine what kinds of reconnectability and what kinds of virtuality piggybacks on images. Um, so it would. I guess a lot of this is influenced by by um, Putari's last book called Chiasmosis, where um, there's a kind of aesthetic politics that, that has to do with turning the act of reception into a form of production and trying to think of technologies of reception of um, sort of trans translation and transmission of of, of affective charges. Um, that are apt to actualize other potentials than the ones that are normally um, selected by things like technologies of reception, like the family or um, schools. So, so I guess I'll we'll stop there. I have um, yes, yes, it was a little hard to follow because of the speed of that, but I guess my central question has to do while you're working this theory out with uh, repetition of binary structures in your map uh, rather than multiplicity. So you have, what's, if I'm hearing this correctly, you have a kind of binary between. Uh, Intensity and um, signification. That's what I'm hearing. Um, and I think you end up with a kind of binary between image, are you placing image somehow as outside of signification? Or am I just saying that? Um, anyway, I was wondering about I was wondering about that as you're thinking this process. Yeah, on, on the one hand, I'm the question was about my what, what 
this seems to be a, re a repetition of binaries within my own presentation between the intensive and the affective and the, and the signifying and the emotional. Um, it's, it's a very good question, and it, it does happen. Part of it happens because I don't, I'm not interested in, in just deconstructing binary oppositions as if they have never functioned and will cease to function. I think they're effectively produced. And part of the trick is to try to understand how they're produced. Um, but if they're produced, then there's something producing that is that is that is the conditions of emergence that isn't the same as that. Uh, so you could fall right back into a binary between those conditions of emergence and what emerges and uh, separates out into binaries. I think that's one of the places where um, chaos theory and theory of complexity can be useful because you can think of that not as a, a binary opposition which is still operating on the level of, of, of meaning and of, of, of signification, but think of it as a bifurcation, literalized. Rather than a binary, there's a real bifurcation. And then you can try to understand what, at the virtual level, because the virtual and the actual are all doubles of each other, what doubles the binary. And you can talk in terms of, of gradients, you can talk in terms of attractors. So rather than being binaries, they're poles of attraction or tendencies that have a certain dynamic or a certain directionality in them, the di dynamics, but the dynamics of different poles of a physical continuum. Um, and then the other, the other thing to try, uh, I think that I need to try to do to keep the danger of those binaries from re from reestablishing themselves, is to make it to present it in such a way that all that is thought together. Because it's not like there's virtuality on the one hand and actuality on the other. They're dimensions of the same reality that, that are in every action, in every situation, in every moment. So it's more of a continual passing in and into and out of one another. And again keep it from becoming just a, a movement of binaries that has to be literalized, physicalized. Um, and I, I think there are sort of a number of resources that could be found for that, chaos theory being one of them. In theories, for example, of uh, the poem on, the, on quantum mechanics of the infinite order might be another one. I think there are a number of ways of processualizing what could be a binary opposition. Um, the, the other binary that comes to mind is the brain-body binary. And when you were talking about the brain, I was thinking about Asian models, which displays the sort of central controlling unit from the brain throughout the entire spinal column, including its neural networks. Um, and you know, what comes to mind that makes sense even from the Western model is the fact that you have networks that come like from your hand or your feet or whatever, that don't have to go to your brain to tell you to pick up your foot when you step on it. And these are loaded throughout the entire um, body. And I was wondering if you were afraid to um, about your use of the Western model of the brain when you're talking about the brain. Yeah, well, it was used, I was talking about a particular set of experience, uh, experiments that was really rooted in that, in that tradition, but it comes to a conclusion that subverts that. Because it, it, it comes to a resonation or feedback model um, that I think makes it easy to reintroduce other um, so called peripheral centers of resonation. The brain, I think, is a central uh, resonance center for uh, resonation, but you're right, there are many others. The, since that I'm actually the most interested in isn't so much vision or touch, it's proprioception, which is a sense that, that is embedded in the muscles and the ligaments and the joints of the body. Um, uh, that has to do with perception of position and posture and movement. Um, and that's a, uh, an example of a, of a dispersed sense that has to network throughout the body before it can register in the brain. Um, and there are many more than, than five senses, and I think it's uh, more interesting to talk in terms of how the senses pass into one another and how they're localized differentially within the body rather than you're talking about dominations of one sense over another or privileging of a single sense. So I'm more interested in synesthesia than the hierarchy of the senses. But I'm just 
Well, uh, the question was what kind of cultural artifacts I would have in mind to talk about in relation to the theory of life um, I'm not sure. I'm the, I sort of have a fixation that I, I can't I can't get over, and it comes up later in this paper. But um, I'm still sort of traumatized by, by events of 15 years ago when Ronald Reagan was elected president. So I'm still thinking through it in relation to that, trying to understand and put them to events since then, trying to understand what kind of strange mutation in sovereignty and in, in, in political operativity happened around that time. Um, so first of all, the answer is in relation to Reagan. In the longer run, though, what, what I want to do is look at it in relation to theories of ritual through another collaboration with, with uh, someone I worked with on an earlier book in uh, the context of uh, um, ecstatic religion in South China. Um, so I'd like to, to go back and see, see if theories of affect might um, be helpful for understanding uh, functioning of ritual in a highly contemporary context context for this and an incredible resurgence of the like, traditional ritual activity in the most highly, the most economically volatile and fastest growing parts of China with really interesting connections into, into the postmodernization and capitalization of, of the culture. So that was, that, that'll be the place that, I mean, once, once I get over it, it's great. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just It is what I want to do. That's really what, what the paper that I was going to write for this is going to be about. And, and I, I haven't done it. I'm talking about it as something that happens in the in a smaller than in a space smaller than the minimum perceivable time is just a way of saying that it's not in time as we as we do the linear uh, unfolding linearly. Um, so it's a way of saying that it happens within that minimal minimum interval. And the, but that that has a kind of that has to do with re resonation and with feedback uh, is just a way of saying we need another model of time that doesn't that doesn't go over to talk about the end of time or the end of history, um, but tries to talk about how history <coughs> emerges from a time that that, that that is not historical. So returning to a certain kind of trans historicism, which has been a dirty word for so long. But not one that, that is in any way an idealism or you know, talk about a transcendence. I think we're going to have to stop the questions now because we're a little bit behind the schedule. So thanks a lot. Bye.